In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Well, welcome to Trinity this morning. I was looking back on Facebook when it gives you that recollection of things that you've done uh, and on the same day a couple of years ago. And I was reminded of a trip that Kathleen and I took, I guess, two or three years ago on one December, January day. We decided to take the train down to New York City for the day. And with apologies to the New Yorkers or honorary New Yorkers in the room, as the old saying goes, it is a nice place to visit, but I would not want to live there. And at one point in our wandering around, we came across the famous Rockefeller Center, 30 Rock, with all its ice skaters and holiday lights where they have the famous Christmas tree. And if you've been there, you know that the buildings in that area all have all sorts of impressive Art Deco style carvings, those 1920s, 1930s carvings and statues decorating them. And they're statues and images of strong men and beautiful women and of people using tools to make things. And they're carvings of strength and power and beauty and success and wealth and of everything that we might hope for and dream of in this life. And we ducked into one of the buildings to warm up, and it was a little strange to see inside of it, in the corner of the lobby, a mosaic on the wall depicting a very different set of people. There on a hill, there's a man teaching a little gathered crowd, except these people are not the rich and the beautiful. These are children and old people and poor people dressed in shabby clothes and rags, people who are disabled, limping on crutches, grieving people who are crying, sick people laying on their beds, people doing small acts of kindness, sharing food, comforting each other. It's a mural of our gospel lesson today from the Sermon on the Mount. And the one teaching the crowds is our Lord Jesus. And it's clear from the mosaic that it's not just some religious lecture that we hear today, but you can tell from the picture that something is happening, something is changing. Jesus is pouring out his grace, pouring out his unconditional favor and loving kindness on his little ones. And it reminded me in a moment in one of the Lord of the Rings books, for those of you sci-fi fans, where after all the heartaches and disasters, the main characters are reunited, and one of them named Sam asks, I thought you were dead, and I thought I was dead. Is everything sad going to come untrue? Is everything sad going to come untrue? And that's the question and the promise today between the two sets of pictures, between the celebration of human strength and power and success, between ourselves seeking ourselves on the outside of the building, and then Jesus blessing the poor and the grieving and the little ones and the merciful on the other side. Christ at work in our foolishness and helplessness, Christ pouring out his love and grace on those who have nothing. God beginning today to make everything sad untrue. Jesus sat down on the mountain today. Sitting was the posture that rabbis took when they were going to tell you something very important. He sat down and opened his mouth, that beautiful mouth. Lord, you have the words of eternal life. He opened his mouth saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Who are the poor in spirit? Except those who have lost everything. Those who have empty hands and empty hearts. Those who have no strength, feel no hope. Those who cannot see a way to keep going. These are the poor and the empty ones Christ calls blessed today because he fills the empty today. He fills you and me. Christ fills the empty poor with himself. 
Blessed are those who mourn, Jesus says. Those who are full of sorrow, full of grief. Those with an empty place at at the table, an empty spot in the bed. When we see people grieving, we say, I'm sorry, or we say, oh, too bad, or we even say, eventually, why don't you get over it? But when God sees the grieving, he calls them blessed. God's heart knows our griefs, he knows our loss, and he fills the grieving, he fills the aching with himself. He comes to those who are lonely and full of sorrow and fills that space with his own sorrowing heart, promising you and me we are never alone. Blessed are you that mourn, he says. I have mourned too. I have borne the scars, but I have risen, and so death no longer has the last word for you or for those you love. Blessed are the meek, Jesus says, those who when they look at themselves, at what they've done for themselves, just shake their heads. Those who are their own worst critics, those who are full of self-doubt and self-hatred. You may not always feel it, Jesus says, but you are blessed. You are blessed, and I hand myself over to you. You who would never dream on your own that you're worthy, well, I give myself to you anyway. And because you have me, you have everything, and you shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger. And thirst for righteousness, Jesus says. Who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they do not have it, because they do not see it yet. We who have no righteousness of our own, we who know our sins and our pasts all too well, the things we've done and left undone, the things we long to see in this world, we who are hungry for a new start, for a better world, a better life, Jesus calls you blessed. And he fills you today with a grace, with a love, with a forgiveness that covers us from head to toe, that strengthens us till we are bursting and overflowing with his forgiveness and life and salvation. Blessed are the merciful, Jesus says, those who can't help but help those who love and show mercy to the sick, to sinners, to the needy, to those who are in in any kind of difficulty, even when it is inconvenient and embarrassing and unappreciated and unpopular. On the cross, we see that the merciful will have a merciful, forgiving Lord and judge. Blessed are the pure of heart, Jesus says. Not a clean or a perfect heart, not in this life, but just a pure heart, which means it belongs to Christ. A heart, a life focused on Jesus and what he has done for us, that is steadfast in his word, that lives to serve him in serving others. There on the cross we see God's heart is focused on you and me and overflows with love for us. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus says, those who endure suffering, those who overcome the evil in the world with good, those who love their enemies and those who are different from them, those who take a minute before reacting or replying, those who don't let the sun go down on their anger. They will be called children of him who made peace with us by the blood of his cross. And blessed are those who are persecuted, Jesus says. This old world is always offended by Christians who don't fall in line, who don't keep quiet, who suffer for what is right, who stand up for their neighbors, who come to others' help when they need it, who are willing to resist the world when what it says is wrong. When we are rejected, well, then we are one with him who was despised and rejected. But as we share in his persecution, we too will share in his joy because he promises to give himself to us. Blessed are you, Jesus says, again and again and again into all those places where we know in this world, in our lives, it doesn't feel like you're blessed. 
We don't usually think it's good to mourn or be persecuted, but God says you're blessed. God says you have his favor, and so it is so. As Walter Cronkite used to say, that's the way it is. God just blesses those the world thinks are cursed. God just comes to those that the world thinks have been abandoned. God just gives hopes to those that the world thinks are completely hopeless. These beatitudes are not God's law book or some to-do list for you, but just an assurance that when you are there, because you are there, then God is also there with you to fill you and to bless you and to pour himself out for you and to give himself completely for you. Because the cross shows us today that it's into your life, into your darkest places, into those places of the most shame and the most grief and the most struggle. That's where God comes. That's where God is at work to bring a blessing and fill you with himself, right where you least expect it, right where you think he can come no further towards you. Because God comes to us not when we are powerful and rich and strong and successful, like some carving on a building in the city. But when we are poor, when we are grieving, when we are hungry for what is right, when we are merciful, when we are persecuted, that's when God comes. That's when we feel his strength and love. That's when he's all that we have, and so we discover he's all we really needed in the first place. There's one last blessing Jesus has today for you. One last blessing for you and me coming to you in your darkest hours, in your weakest, neediest places. God taking your death and turning it into life. Rejoice. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. The promise we can't even imagine. The promise of heaven. The promise that God loves us so much that that relationship must last forever. Heaven, where faith becomes sight, where all that is wrong is made right, where tears become laughter, where every hope, every dream, every yearning we can barely hope for here is come true. Blessed are you, Jesus says. You too may have thought you were dead, but everything sad is becoming untrue. So blessed are you. Rejoice and be glad. Your reward is great in heaven. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.